ourselves quite the rainstorm outside right now. So I hope you guys, uh, hope you don't mind it. I'm really glad you guys enjoyed the overview, the gloss through this book last time. So let's, let's keep at it. Carry on and, um, I guess good news I'll start off with. The best news is that... can read 
then. I think this is a search. Search me diligently. And I don't know what that word is. If it's a, a person who this uh, E. Brown Wilson, maybe N.H. for New Hampshire, September of 18, 1843. That's 27, 18 years before the Civil War. And, um, man, it's just cool. Search me diligently. And I think that's what I love about this book is it's accessible to an individual like myself and like many of you who weren't really formally educated in either sciences or let alone astronomy in particular and um, that's who this book was dedicated to. So you can see here it says 1836 and um, yeah so it's Thomas.
promises Mr. or Dr. Dr. Dix um, introduction here. And again, it's uh, I feel like it's a it's a conjunction of the the tactile history age of the book, the actual materials and the time in which you know they they come out of look I'm getting a little bit on my hand and um, you know the writing the context of the this speech in which they write not only that but the knowledge that they had and um, and it's just so uh, the, the history is so so just overflowing out of this book all right so Sure. 
right, so the last Gonna have to make that out and let me know in 
experiences. Oh. Something of the Pleiades is the center around which the sun This is much more the old version, though it's easier to understand as far as an index goes. And it's interesting that, you know, look at the, look how it's offset. It's kind of like at an angle, the text, with respect to the actual page.
see. You can see the uh, embossing. Maybe you can hear it too. even 
transfer each object from the center of mass. So if the center of this pen, it weighs a little heavier than the pencil. So the center of mass is going to be closer to the pen. So R, if we're measuring the force, I believe it goes the force of mass 1 on mass 2 is this equation using a mass 1 on mass 2. Actually, no, I don't want to say I know, because I don't. If I had to guess, that's what I'd say, but I might be wrong. Um, but anyways, it's generally the force of one of these on the other one. And that is uh, what R is going to be measured with respect to. So if you're measuring the force of this on this pen, you're going to measure R with respect. Maybe the R would be the, uh, maybe it's the distance from the center of mass of these two objects closer to the pen, because the pen's heavier, but still outside of the pen. Uh, from the pen to that center of mass. Anyways, you get the force, which is the acceleration. Um, it's F equals MA is a famous equation. It's mass times the acceleration under which that mass undergoes. The mass which that, uh, the acceleration which that mass undergoes. It's the measure of how, how much time it takes for a object of a certain mass to move a certain distance. And um, the change, and that's velocity, so acceleration is the change in velocity, meaning how fast, let's say the time in which it takes for an object to change from moving a certain distance over a period of time to moving a greater or lesser distance in the same period of time. Uh, I won't get into that too much more. That's, um, that's something we'll have to say for a, uh, a proper, maybe a a small little lesson on uh, rocket propulsion or something like that. That would be cool. Alright, so All right, we'll save that for later. Um, let's see. I busted this book out. about a 
I'd say about 80% of the book is prior to 1833. But, so we have, uh, you know, as far as astronomy goes, we have Galileo. Well, think about it like this. We have Copernicus. Is the oldest. A century after that, we have Kepler and Galileo. Copernicus is in the, let's say, around 1500. We'll just say roughly average. Galileo, so he's still full on into the late Renaissance, we could say. There you have Copernicus. Let's try to find him. That's the time of Raphael and Michelangelo, Hieronymus Bosch. Let's keep an eye on science and technology. Notice, um, not much in the yellow science and technology here. Um, glass mirrors were greatly improved by a new Venetian manufacturing technique. Italy was the capital of the, um, what do you call it, the crucible of modern capitalism, out of which the, the status of an individual was much um, elsewhere outside of Italy. Your status was entirely genetically dependent, or at least uh, heredit hereditarily on your bloodline, whether you came from royalty or not, there's very little chance you were going to change social castes. Whereas in Italy, the late Renaissance, if you were a talented, you still were very, um, you know, unless you were an exceptionally talented art artist or a statesman, you had to be a very talented, uh, let's say, manipulator of capital and wealth and currency and trades, goods, bartering. But nonetheless, Italy was the center. It was the place most likely to be advantageous to someone looking to change their lot in life. It was the... Uh, it was the center of the Renaissance. So let's keep that in mind. A lot of innovation happening there, in other words, both social and technological. I don't want to go through all of this, but um, I just want to keep in mind all this happened. You know, 1533 is, uh, you know, just 30, 20, right now this is maybe 20 years after Columbus discovered America, or the Caribbean islands, at least. So America is just being populated. Um, black slaves imported into Hispaniola from Spain replace the moribund Indian laborers. Newfoundland God Banks starting to be exploited. Exploited. Columbus shipwrecked for a year. All right. Yeah, I wanna. I wanna go over all of this some other time. As far as let's see, the technology is concerned.
parts for guns and uh, other tools and things. The technologies and the methods of craftsmanship that would eventually lead to those hundreds of years later were a lot of them were, um, you know, first walking hand in hand with uh, pure science. That's what I love about this. But this book is way closer to, I would say, this in terms of um, in terms of the proximity to having to having to observe the heavens with only a a telescope with a you know a roughly polished lens and um, this book was before electric the electric light bulb for instance so in a way this book in 1833 is much closer to its 300 year old 200 year old maybe 100 year old um, lifestyle counterpart than us living 150 to 200 years after it's written now that we have let alone the internet we have just even what we consider basic tools we have transportation we have air mail to um, we had the telephone and you know further back we had the telegram to communicate nearly instantaneously we had air mail being once airplanes were invented that allowed us to have it's starting to thunder out there nice pretty loudly again but that allowed us to have um, much more instantaneous we it, you know, communication the relationship of the individual to nature as it were is much more removed nowadays is, is what I'm trying to get at I guess we didn't have air conditioning we didn't have modern anesthesia in uh, surgery um, you know no refrigerated foods uh, very you know, unless you're literally in a place where it's snowing um, most food most if not all food was not preserved it was fresh fresh meat if you had any meat if you were wealthy enough to eat meat that you didn't catch yourself um you know even the gun up until the early to mid 1800s i think was was a musket and ball you couldn't there was no revolver or anything. It was one shot every two minutes or so, or however long it took you to reload that musket ball. So, warfare was different. Everything we think about today, the writers of this book, they were born in the 1700s. So they were much closer. And that's why I, uh, I think my point and the significance of that for me is that they were much more aware of the, um, the implications of astronomy for civilization and for the flourishing of society, as we'll, we'll touch upon when we read the introduction. Um, you know, as far as needing to keep track of when to plant so that you literally didn't starve. Civil, entire society starved because of a miscalculation of when the rains would come and therefore you know, floods and um, navigations across oceans. Columbus relied not on a GPS using Einstein's theory of relativity to track them or uh, really no radar
spirituality, which explain how human minds, human consciousness, the patterns that we act out, and um, that inform how we should navigate the world outside of us, that science explains. So there's a um, there's a distinction there, but we, you know, at the time, just like Kepler and Newton were, um, they made, they established expertise in multiple disciplines. So I love how Newton was on top of being the inventor of calculus. He's one of the most revered scientists ever respected almost divinity in terms of scientists in that as close as you can get <laughs> in the science realm. He uh, was a mathematician, a physicist, you know, before these were even proper or formal uh, careers. He was a optom, uh, yeah, physicist dealing with light. He, uh, I mean, he made a significant career out of controlling the English mint and the, um, you know, the, what do you call it, the institution that pressed and created coins, English currency. He was in charge of the, you know, uh, overseeing the ratios of different metal alloys that went into the standard gold and silver and copper and bronze of the uh, English currencies traded at the time, coins. Um, and so on top of all that, he was a uh, mysteriously, he was, to us nowadays it seems, to the uneducated observer, he was very, very mysteriously into alchemy. And that seems like pseudoscience and superstitious nowadays, but as Carl Jung has pointed out and made a very compelling case for alchemy is actually a very a very symbolic way of understanding how humans think and what we wish for and how we perceive the world in a very um, in a very even non-spiritual or at least non-religious way alchemy tells us a lot about um tells us a lot about the the ideas that permeated society long before modern science became so so dominant in its effects to the you know modern human being but anyways I digress we'll tackle that as we get into astronomy and its uses So we have Copernicus, early 1500s, fast forward 100 years, a century later, early 1600s, here we have Kepler and Galileo um, honing in and, and sharpening Kepler, or Copernicus's, sorry, kept Copernicus's 1500s view. Kepler and Galileo were able to actually make Galileo's uh, case, observations of Jupiter, Jupiter's moons, our own moon, Venus. 
pre-scientific, pre-modern, um, late renaissance era where people could have multiple expertises or expertise in multiple domains because so little about the world was known. So, um, these guys were like the last, you know, part of the last few generations right before storm was fast approaching at the time of this book, if you will. And I say that because a huge cloud, a huge storm head, storm cell, is actually right about on top of us right now. So it's going to be, we're about to be blasted with some, some heavy rain and thunder and probably a, probably a couple cracks of lightning.
thousand years of slow, you know, a uh, hundred generations maybe, or was that fifty? Maybe fifty generations of people they had to slowly, methodically, carefully, um, you know, incrementally build upon this structure of inquiry into the world. So. unit of heat calorie. 
that. Um, Mendeleev, devising the periodic table of the elements, was not even written or invented at the time of this, this book. So, so many things. The our modern concept of what light fundamentally is, or at least its relationship to electromagnetism, was not known until 40 years after this book was written. some of his books 
guy from? 1600s. Okay. Anyways, yeah, he wrote some books on astronomy, very much in line with Elijah Burritt, which is why he, um, you know, wrote his introduction, collaborated with him on this book.
So yeah, he converted some property he owned to the stone store into a school and installed an observatory. Now, that's one of my dreams. That's definitely one of my dreams to have my own observatory on a a quiet, um, a light pollutionless plot of land out in the mountains, maybe out in the uh, near Boone or Blowing Rock. So anyways, he, um, he began writing Geography of the Heavens, wrote a logarithmic book, <laughs> numbers up to 10 million. Imagine everything is before uh, electronic calculators, so we is amazing the the amount of mundane math that probably went into doing the mathematical calculations for determining the position of Neptune and they were correct but I don't believe they were correct the first time they tried though so that's interesting Near 
write down some things that are interesting about this uh, that Mr. Thomas Dick has to say about the about the um, what does he call it? The uses the uses of astronomy. The advantages of the study of astronomy. description part. 
such other descriptive features as seemed the most worthy of notice. I then returned to my room. To transcribe and classify these memoranda in their proper order. So you're repeating the same observations at different hours of the same evening and on the other evenings at various periods for a succession of years. A succession of years there. So he's he's done this personal studies, not consulting data tables or anything. Although he might have done that too, but he into this book is his own
Axe of Infinity, which the Celestial Vault presents. The most resplendent terrestrial scene sinks into inanity, and appear unworthy in being set in competition with the glories of the sky. So he's saying there the really anything, any science studying anything on the world on Earth doesn't really in comparison to the concepts, the, the vast dist distances in both space and time that are represented by the observations made in the firmament above. Independently of the sublimity of its objects and the pleasure arising from their contemplation, Astronomy is also a study of, of vast utility in consequence of its connection with terrestrial arts and sciences, many of which are indebted to the observations of the principles of this science for that degree of perfection to which they have attained. So he goes on from here to... Um, pages to just elaborate on some of the interesting historical um, impacts and, and, and completely crucial uh, uses of astronomy, just uh, invaluable situations that have uh, advanced, radically advanced our understanding of other areas of science using the stars above, different features of them. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do, because I just actually noticed this piece falling off, which scares me. So I'm going to put this bad boy aside, and we are not going to touch this one anymore, because the, the text is the same. This, this copy instead. Okay. So let's see. Okay. 
able to measure the slightest, the slightest bit of tilt on one side of the mountain. They went over to the other side of the mountain and measured a slight, you know, a almost imperceptible pull. But somehow, I, I can't even believe this is real, but it is. And it's been verified. And not only that, it, it didn't even happen. It happened before the 1800s. It happened in the mid-1700s. It might have been in the late. Let's find out, but um, I'll look it up in a minute. Astronomy has been of immense utility to the science of geography. And here he means actually understanding the makeup of the, the Earth. You know, learning about geo. Study of geo, the Earth.
surface and you can see both
densities in the volumes of the earth and the mountain, if the density and volume of Shaolin could be ascertained, then so could the density of the earth. And then once this was known, it would in turn yield approximate values for those of the other planets. Because although we didn't know the mass of the earth, we recognized that we could, through parallax that I talked about in my basics of astronomy video, parallax allowed us to measure distances of the planets distances using trigonometry, so one of the many uses of trigonometry. And so we were able to roughly estimate, at this point in time, the, you know, the pole, the relative pole of the planets on each other. So the, the pole of Mercury on Venus, Venus on Earth, Earth on Mars, was known in particular ratios.
this uh, little container right here and when the Earth's gravity is perfectly perpendicular to this this line right here that bubble will be right in the middle because the pressure on the, uh, that the liquid is creating on the bubble is equal if you go like this the water will want to be closer because it's down here it will, we will want to be closer to the center of Earth's gravity likewise for this so I guess the air the air is lightest it will float to the top and it separates from the water or whatever liquid that is it's probably a really bad explanation but it's the best I got at the moment and it's the analogy I want to convey with this because
chose this mountain just for that reason, so that they could easily make a quick, um, you know, a rough estimate of its volume and shape and other characteristics, and therefore distance from here to here, from its outer rim to its center. So the curvature of the Earth was actually accounted for. So they have uh, what they did was take. So they knew that a star was directly overhead. And let's see if this is the Earth here now. Let's forget about this. So this. So they met. 
measured the true zenith, which they marked by a star way up here. And we could even, like, you know, make it more accurate. You can imagine when a star is relative to the Earth, it is trillions and trillions of times. The distance from the Earth to a star is trillions of times, if not more, um, what the distance between each side of a mountain would be. There is no, there's hardly any significant angle from this side up to this side of the mountain. So they were able to look directly up here on the mountain and on the other side of the mountain. The star should have been, um, well the star is directly overhead at the same time, you know, they do it all simultaneously, so the Earth, the Earth's rotation is also factored out, compensated for. What's left is the difference of the angle that they call plum, which normally would be directly the line pulling the plum to the center of the Earth should keep it directly perpendicular to the Earth's surface, pointing to the star. But because the mountain's gravity was pulling it a little bit, the line was not straight up. It was actually a little bit off, and symmetrically so on the other side of the mountain. of 20 seconds, arc seconds, they were able to, yeah, the, um, the guy Masculine, who was the lead of the team, was able to produce a fundamental, a, uh, let's see, what did he say, if any doubts remained about the truth of the Newtonian system based on the universal law of gravitation. They were now totally removed. So how amazing was that? Alright, and then the, let's see. Oh, and just a little side note, the art of cartography, the technique of cartography, measuring the lines of elevation around a certain mountain on a map was was um, was developed just for the purpose of measuring this mountain's elevation and you know characteristics. So an entire discipline was just invented to um, be able to help this experiment. Um, 
in general we were able to roughly determine the use this to determine the mass of the earth and therefore uh, like I was alluding to earlier once we were able to fill in that variable for the mass of the earth we were able to determine the other masses that um, exhibited uh, you know proportional gravitational pulls on each other from the other you know based on their orbits and the speeds of their orbits so so much was discovered by measuring a variation of a pole from true as they call it true meaning uh, directly perfectly perpendicular to a flat earth's horizontal surface the deviation of true from the zenith star was able to determine all this um, and we couldn't have done it without a you know an eternal a static a unchanging variable like the star with which or a constant I guess I should say not variable the exact opposite of a variable with which to measure all these Characteristics of the Earth against. So he goes on to make an, a great case for the complete reliance of ocean travel, navigation on stellar phenomena, stars. I'm getting a little too uh, pretentious here with my poetry. without the knowledge of which a mariner could never have traced his course through the pathless oceans to remote regions. The globe never would have been circumnavigable, nor an intercourse opened up between the inhabitants of distant lands. He was able to ascertain with precision which port he was bound to. I love this part. Um, let's see. Able to ascertain with precision on what particular portion of the teraqueous, teraqueous, a fusion of terrestrial and aqueous, land and ocean, land and water globe, what portion of the teraqueous globe he is at any time placed, what course he is pursuing, how far he's traveled from the board in which from which he embarked, what dangerous rocks or shoals lie near the line of his course, and in what direction he is destined to haven. It's only by astronomical observations, or at least chiefly, that such particulars can be determined. So he can, um, given he can calculate his distance east or west from a given meridian and by taking the meridian altitude of the sun or of a star he can learn his distances distance from the equator which i know is much easier to determine the latitude that you're on the parallel around the uh, the thing the lines distances from the equator, the lines parallel to the equator, rather than the longitudinal lines that go vertically around the Earth. Because the Earth spins, so you have to have precise measurements of time to be able to recognize which stars should be directly overhead at certain areas of night. Certain times of night. He goes on to talk about how it opened up commerce, and uh, of course he skips over uh, the um, some of the more violent and belligerent voyages, more plundering.
was great. It was quite the feat for the adventurers of the 15, 16, 17, 1800s. Um, so anyways, the promotion of philanthropic objects, trade and commerce, and in a real way it did, you know, of course minus the slavery, it did open up transcontinental Transatlantic, Trans Pacific, even commerce, which brought new metals to places and allowed the the fusion of textiles and raw, um, you know, raw. Uh, what do they call it? Ores, you know, into new markets and and, and spices and all sorts of exotic phenomena. to have full. 
like uh, two or three days at the end of our now Julian calendar. Add up, you know, 12 times to about, about being a month, a month or so off. And so every year the seasons, if they did calculate um, tillage by the seasons of, of uh, the seasons by the moon, their seasons would be very, very off very quickly. Using the stars, however, the stars are essentially fixed, essentially fixed in the, um, with respect to our I guess with respect to of all the other objects closest, like the sun, moon, and the other planets, and the occasional, you know, comets and asteroids, the stars are eternal and fixed, and so we can get a much more accurate determination of the, um, the rotation of the Earth around the sun. I guess it would have been hard for them to recognize that we were returning to the same spot in our orbit, roughly. Um, but once they recognized that, it took about, you know, 365 rotations of the sun around the Earth for the same set of stars to appear on the horizon at, you know, at dawn or dusk. They would recognize that that most accurately corresponds with the seasons, the winters, the spring, and the floods that would come after the rains of the spring. And so they would know, he says. Thank <laughs> you. 
exact measure of time is of considerable importance, of course, in arranging and conducting the affairs of life, without which society and its movements would soon run into confusion. And, and again, I enjoy the deeply, you know, inaccurate um, conception of, of, you know, what he's considering an accurate measurement of time. They're, uh, they were able to accurately measure time, but the access to clocks, they didn't yet have a, well, maybe they had pocket watches, but they would have been, you know, multiple minutes off of, um, you know, their accuracy very frequently. So, our ability to all agree what exact second it is using our phones and the internet makes this, you know, very quaint in our ideas. But, again, we can't confuse our privilege, our technological privilege, that's been one over years with um, our own, you know, skills and abilities. It doesn't make us any better than them. It's just, uh, you know, if anything, we must, we have to respect the the privation of all the uh, the goods and luxuries that we have that they did not. But he says, for example, if we couldn't ascertain within an hour or two when an assembly or a concourse of human beings was to meet for an important purpose, all such purposes would soon be frustrated and human improvement prevented. So our ideas of time and succession and duration are derived from motion. This is a crucial part, so true. Um, from motion, time is the, is what goes by, it's how we measure how fast something moves, how long it took to get from here to here, is what we measure time with, with the motion of physical, you know, physical objects in the world, and the most fundamental motion is that of the stars the most eternal, the most consistent, the most constant, um, the best standard of measurement up until, you know, the atomic clock or whatever, was the motion of the eternal stars. Of course, we did, you know, have uh, the measurement of... Um, Yeah. 
this, um, although regular, it, it, uh, is not in concert, it's not in perfect conjunction with the cycles of night and day, uh, they often shift by about 45 minutes a day, I think. Through the past periods of time, can ascertain what remains. 
just what, um, where on Earth the eclipses would have been based on the positions of the moon and the sun with respect to the Earth. They're pretty amazing, actually. So he says, Calvisius, for example, found his chronology on 144 eclipses of the sun and 127 of the moon, which he had calculated for the purpose of determining epochs and settling dates. The grand junction of the planets Jupiter and Saturn, which is um, certainly a very rare occurrence. It says here, in fact, once in every 800 years. So that's, that's amazing, you know. And the same point of the zodiac, even. So, again, the concept of the eternal, you know, essentially unchanging movement of the stars. The stars, with the exception of the Earth's wobble every 24,000 years, the stars for every, you know, every time span of about two to 3,000 years, the stars remain essentially fixed and constant. Never, you know, unless the sky is cloudy, they never fail to appear in the night sky. So, so it says, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in a particular zodiac, which has happened only eight times since the Mosaic creation, I'm not sure what, if that means Moses or not, but furnishes chronology with incontestable proofs of the date of events this is when such phenomena happen to be on such data, Sir Isaac Newton actually determined the period when Thales the philosopher flourished, particularly from the famous eclipse which he predicted and which happened just as the two armies under Alcates, king of Lydia, and Syaxares, the Medi, were engaged, and which has been calculated to have happened in the fourth year of the 30, 43rd Olympiad, because they, the Greeks apparently counted their history, historical dates, in terms, in units of four years. Every four years being the occurrence of an Olympia, uh, the Olympics. So, that would mean that the 43rd Olympiad, the final year, the fourth would mean that you multiply that by um, four, I guess. Then we have 160, 70, 172 years after the original, you know, date. So I guess they started counting in seven, seven seventy five, seven seventy five BC in the year, um, so the 43rd Olympia in the fourth year of it would have been 603 BC. And then Dr. Halley of Halley's Comet fame, I think he was a, yeah, a celebrated astronomer in the 17th century, determined the very day and hour of the landing of Julius Caesar in Britain from the circumstances stated in Caesar's, you know, written account, a book called His Commentaries. Okay. So, the rest of it, I don't want to bore you guys with too much. It's mostly him. See, the research is of astronomy to demonstrates that in the power of the creator, um, he's kind of speculating, maybe we'll touch upon that next time, but it's, uh, less, less technical, less 
scientific, less rational, more philosophical and speculative, which is cool, but um, I kind of want to uh, draw a line here. I've been, I think I've been at this a total of about five hours today, so we'll call it quits for now. We'll call it quits. This is, uh, it's been a fun, ongoing adventure, so I'm so really, really glad you guys are enjoying this as well. Um, again, keep me updated, keep me informed. I'll try to, I'll try to pay the proper attention to all your comments. It just means so much to, uh, to see all the love and, um, you know, shared joy you guys get in looking through our books here. We will, as long as there is material to mine out of these, we'll continue. I'll have to fix that. We'll continue, uh, you know, browsing these. So, glad you stuck with me for this song. If you did, uh, remember, I have a, um, a Patreon account if you guys enjoy the material and especially you know, want to donate a buck or two or something. Um, I really want to thank all of you guys who do. It means a lot. Um, other than that, just, yeah, show me, show me what you thought. Comment, you know, if you want to like it, like it. If you don't, just hit that, that, hit that dislike twice. And, um, as always, I hope you guys have a great evening. And we'll see you.